Happy Sunday. It's Pastor Ralph again. So excited again to bring God's word to you. Thank you for tuning in and listening. I'm going to get right into prayer right now and we'll get right into the meat of the subject. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again this morning. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for waking us up and giving us a, a fresh breath of air. Lord, we thank you now that as we get into your word, that the Holy Spirit will teach us and guide us and lead us into your truth. In Jesus name. Amen. All right. Well, I'm excited about our subject today and uh, hopefully we can get some insight on what we're going to be doing next. You know, it was the question that came to mind. I was praying and asking God, what's next for us? And what I heard in my spirit uh, this morning was that God wanted us to know how to live in a circumspect manner how to live in a circumspect manner. So what does it really mean to be circumspect? And so we're going to take a look at some definitions and synonyms and antonyms. And then we're going to get right into the word to show you where that is in scripture. Because today, a lot of people probably have never heard that word. It's an old King James word, but it means something very simplistic. And so I want to get right into it and teach on that today. Now, let's take a look at this word. What does it mean to live in a circumspect manner? Uh, the word circumspect means to be careful. It has to do with consideration of all circumstances and possible consequences in one's life. And so if I'm going to look at life and be circumspect, I must consider a careful approach to decisions that I make and a careful approach to how I walk and how I live. When we talk about our walk, we're talking about how we live. The Bible says that our walk must be lined up with the scripture, must be led by the spirit and walk by the spirit. And so to be circumspect is to have a careful, decisive walk in line with God's word, because that is what it means to be circumspect. And it goes on to say, uh, here's some synonyms, to be alert, to be careful, to proceed with caution in your life. And I'll tell you, there's uh, never been a time like today that we need to be cautious more than any other time since in my lifetime, possibly in your lifetime, but we need to proceed with caution. Uh, we need to be conservative at this time, not to be uh, so liberal, but be conservative with our monies, uh, with things that we do, our plans, you know, think conservatively because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. And we live today, uh, because God has only given us today to live. So for a Christian to be nothing less than conservative with their means and what God has provided for them would be unwise. And so when we talk about having a circumspect life and living in a circumspect manner, uh, conservative would be uh, one of the words that I would come to understand a little more about my everyday life. To be guarded, to be heedful, uh, to operate from a standpoint of safety, you know, being safe. Uh, I've come from a, a place where I work in life and work with people and safety always comes first should always be safe and have a safe environment to work in. So if we're going to be circumspect, we need to consider our safety. Uh, some antonyms would be basically the opposite of what I've just said to be careless, to be uh, unmindful of your surroundings and your circumstances and situations, to be unsafe and heedless. That's something we really got to consider. So when God is calling us to a place of being careful, calling us to a place to live, conservative and to live uh, in a manner which is circumspect. These are the things that he's talking about. Now, I'm going to take you to a prayer that David prayed. And this prayer is something that I would like for you to also uh, read during the week and study it because David says a lot in this prayer that we need to consider when it comes to talking to God and walking with God. And it's found in Psalms 26. And David prays a prayer that I believe we need to line up with. I mean, it's a prayer uh, of his heart. You know, David always had a heartfelt prayer to God. After all, the Bible says that God said David is a man after his own heart. And I can begin to see when I read through the Psalms why God might have said that about him, because David's heart was always a heart of contrition. He was always trying to please God and do the right thing, even though we see that David was a man and he had some life style that probably was not really good, but yet God loved him because of his heart. And so let's take a look at verse one of Psalms 26. And again, I want you to read this during the week, read it more than three times if you can, because when you line yourself up with David's prayer, you'll find yourself in a circumspect manner. In other words, living carefully, living conservatively before God. All right. In verse one, it says, vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. So he's asking God to vindicate him 
because he has walked in his integrity. And integrity is truth and honesty and living real before God. You know, we gotta be people of integrity. And when we talk about what's next for us and what does it mean to live circumspectly, we have to understand that we need to be people of integrity. And it says, again, vindicate me, O Lord. This is a prayer that he's praying to God. He says, for I have walked in my integrity and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. And I have to ask myself this question when it comes to the manner in which God wants us to operate our lives. Have I trusted God in an unwavering manner? I would say, yeah, but no, not in every case. And I want to get to the place where whatever my circumstances are, whatever the situation is in front of me, that I never want to doubt God or to live outside of what he's planned for me, even if I don't understand it. There are a lot of things happening in our world today that we don't know what the outcome is going to be, but we do know this, that God is in control and we have to place our confidence in him. So when David's asking, hey, I have trusted in you and your word, and he says, and without wavering, and then he says something that I believe should be helpful to you and I, he says, examine me, O Lord, and try me. I mean, to ask God to examine you when God already knows. What kind of heart must one have to say to God, examine me? In other words, he doesn't think in his own mind that he's perfect and that everything in his life is okay. So he's asking the Lord to scan over him and examine him. And he says this, listen to how this is written. Examine me, O Lord, and try me. When you say try me, what you're asking for is test me. You're saying to God, test me. And then it goes on to say, test my mind and my heart. See, in other words, David wanted to know that he knew that what was in his heart was right. And so he asked the Lord for his help. He said, Lord, try me and test me to make sure that my heart is right. David wanted no surprises when he stood before God. And I don't want any surprises either. So if I'm going to live in a circumspect manner, I want to be careful to do the things that God has called us to do. And I want to make sure that what I don't know, that I come to know by asking for God's help in life. All right. He goes on to say, you see how this is a great prayer? I mean, if we can learn to pray this way, the way that David prays, I'll tell you, that would be a blessing to ourselves and it would be something God would be pleased with. He goes on to say, verse three, he says, for thy loving kindness is before my eyes. He also recognized that God's mercy, loving kindness is just another word for mercy. He says, thy loving kindness is before my eyes. In other words, I can see your loving kindness in my life. And sometimes when we go through life circumstances and situations, sometimes it clouds our judgment. It takes away the gratitude that we might have for God. And it makes us to become unworthily in our mindset, to have an unworthy conscience. And when you start thinking in an unworthy manner, you start deducing what God has done for you down to ridiculous things that you think with your mind. And David says this, thy loving kindness is before my eyes. In other words, I can see that you've been merciful unto me. And see, so that would help David to be circumspect before God. He says, and I have walked in thy truth. You know, to walk in the truth is nothing short of walking in the word. In other words, not walking according to your own imagination, ideas, or plans, but learning how to be circumspect and be conservative and walk in line with truth, getting into the word and accepting truth. He says here in verse four, he says, I do not sit with deceitful men. You know, there are a lot of deceitful people in the earth. And this is not so much the thing that David thinks he's better than people. But when you know that people are deceitful, you can't congregate with deceitful people. You can't sit amongst them because to sit amongst deceitful people would cause you to be unwise. The things that they do, the things that they say, the things that they plan are deceitful. So David says, I don't sit with them, nor will I go with pretenders. In other words, he would not go with people who are being phony, people who are being fake. There are a lot of people faking their walk with God, faking Christianity, who are faking with their heart to act like one way when really there's something else. And so David says, I don't hang out with pretenders. And you got to think about this in life. Are you pretending? Are you hanging out with people who pretend all the time? People who say one thing and then do another, live one way and yet live another way when no one's looking. He says, I don't hang out with pretenders because David was a man of circumspection. He wanted to live in a manner that was circumspect before God, being careful, being wise, 
you know, living in an alert manner, being sober with his walk. In verse five, he says, I hate the assembly of evildoers. And when you think about how evil people congregate together to do evil, I mean, we got a lot of things more than just gangs in the street. People would think evil would just be gangs or the mafia and things like that. But, you know, people people are evil in all kinds of matters. People are evil around your dinner table. People are evil in your workplace. People are evil everywhere. And so you don't want to just look at, oh, those gangs are evil or the mafia people are evil. You know, but there are many deceitful people who are more evil because you don't know that they're evil. See, we can look at a gang member and say, oh, that guy's no good. He's bad news. You know, we can look at the mafia and say, oh, they've been in business for a long time they've been controlling things it's pretty scary to be around a mafia but see when you have people who are deceitful and you don't know that they're that way and they can enter into your life and become pretty familiar with you your family and everyone that you're affiliated with and yet later on it's like the jesus said the a little leaven will leaven the whole lump you got to be aware of the leaven of the pharisees you know you can see this rise of arrogance and pride that comes in and so he says i don't sit around evildoers. We find in Psalms 1, he said, blessed is the man that does not sit around scoffers and mockers. That's the same thing. When people are mocking God or scoffing at the word or scoffing at ministry, those are the type of people that you need to pray for, but not assemble with. Now we're talking about walking in a circumspect manner. So we're talking about being careful because our company, the company we keep, bad association, the Bible teaches, corrupts good manners or behavior. So you may be kind of straddling the fence yourself. And if you hang around people that have no morality, then you're going to tip on the other side of the fence and you're not going to be circumspect. You're going to be a person who lives outside of what God has for you. And David, again, was praying to God this way. After David had did so much in the kingdom and so much God had done through him, he was still asking God to search his heart. Have you ever in the last week or two or month or year, have you ever had the notion to ask God to search your heart, to see if there be any iniquity in you or any wrong thing in you? Maybe how I treat my wife. You know, Lord, am I treating my wife the way that is pleasing to you? If you're a woman and you're treating your husband in a way that's not pleasing to God, you might want to consider asking God's help to treat your husband and your children in a way that God is pleased with. And so, you know, if you ask that question of the Lord, he's going to attend to that question and answer it for you. And he's going to support you in becoming more and better and pleasing, more pleasing to him. And so I don't think it's something that we should be afraid of. I think we should straight up ask God, you know, am I doing okay? How am I doing? How is my life before you? Are you pleased with me? I mean, that's a, a, a good prayer. It's a prayer of integrity. And this is what David is doing uh, when we talk about circumspect living. And so he goes on to say in verse five again, he says, I hate the assembly of evildoers. He says, and I will not sit with the wicked. I will not sit with the wicked. I want you to leave your finger there and I'm gonna go right to Psalms one because this keeps repeating. So I wanna read into it. When you talk about wickedness and uh, trying to live righteously and conservatively before God. In Psalms one, it says this, listen. He says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. This person does not take advice from wicked people and nor stand in the path of sinners. In other words, get out of the way of sinners. Let them go through. He says, nor sit in the seat of a scoffer. You see, this is really paramount to circumspect living. Then he goes on to say in verse two, because as a person lives before God and they seek God's approval and you want to be circumspect before God and conservative and wise and alert and sober, here's what you have to do in verse two. But his delight is in the law of the Lord or in God's word. And his law, he meditates day and night. And then God makes a promise with that because my desire and my delight is in God's word. And I choose to meditate on it day and night, meaning that when I rise in the morning, I'm thinking about God's word. And when I lay down at night, I'm thinking about God's word. It's my meditation. It's my thought. You know, it's my mindset. He says this. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. He says, which yields its fruit in its season, and listen, and its leaf does not wither. Now watch this. And in whatever he does, he prospers. Because this person is living in a circumspect manner, God says that he's going to bless him and prosper him because of his integrity. But then he goes on, he gives the contrast to that. 
He says in verse four, the wicked are not so. This is why you don't want to hang out with wicked people or deceitful people or people who are pretender. Now, I know sometimes we talk about this as though there are those people out there. But you want to think about also, are you a pretender? You know, do you live falsely before God? Because it's not always about those people or the other people. It could be us too. And you want to stop and think about, wait a minute, before I cast a judgment or criticism on who's a fake person or a phony person or a pretender, am I that person? I mean, am I fake and phony before God? Do I act the same way in front of others as I do before God in my own personal worship? You know, I'm all holy before God when I'm in the home and I'm praying to him and I'm doing things right. But then when I get out in public, am I the same guy? as I am when I pray to God, then when I go outside and I talk to others, do I change? You know, does my skin change? Does my color change? Does my behaviors change? You know, you want to ask yourself that question. Are you a person of integrity? And do you walk circumspectly before God? And it's okay if you don't, because you don't have to stay that way. We can learn. And that's what this is all about. So what he says here, he says, the wicked are not so. He says, but they are like the chaff, which the wind drives away. The chaff is the little housing around the stem of the wheat. And when the wheat starts to burst through the chaff, it gets really light and kind of feathery. So when the wind blows, the chaff just comes away from the wheat. It separates itself. He says, the wicked, he says, are like a chaff and the wind drives it away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. In other words, you won't have a standing in the judgment before God when you're living wickedly. He says, therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. So what that tells me is that God's people in the final time of judgment will not be judged with the wicked people. The righteous and the wicked will be separated. And that's what he's telling us. He says this in verse six. He says, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He says, but the way of the wicked will perish. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And so I felt we need to go there because David is talking about some of those similar things. And I thought that would help us to think of being more circumspect and walk in a manner that's more pleasing to God when we see exactly what the word says between that which is good and evil, that which is righteous and unrighteous. So we go back over here again to Psalms 26, and I believe I left off on verse five. He says, I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. Now, verse six says this, I shall wash my hands in innocence. In other words, when you wash your hands, are you washing your hands really clean because you're innocent and your heart is right? Or are you washing blood and dirt off your hands because you're guilty? David says, I want to wash my hands in innocence. In other words, when I wash my hands, and this is not literal, but he's talking about having clean hands, clean heart, clean mind before God. So in that sense, you know, you can wash your hands all day long, but if your heart is wicked, you're still dirty. <clears throat> so David is talking about something that's more uh, substitutionary than actual literal. So he says, I will wash my hands in innocence and I will go about thine altar, O Lord. In other words, I won't even come before God if my heart's not right. And a lot of times, you know, if we don't walk in forgiveness, we're not walking circumspectly. If we're not walking in a way that's pleasing to God, it's kind of a moot point to go to God and ask God for anything because you're asking God for something that you're unwilling to do for others. So it's really important that you have a clean mindset and a clean heart before God, that you check the way you walk and the way you act, and the way you talk before God. Like I said, a lot of people go to church and they hide in the church. You know, they feel safe in the church. They feel more pure in the church because everybody in the church, in a lot of churches, there's crosses on the wall. There's a big altar up there. You know, there's these holy people standing in white robes that are the praise team or the choir. And then you have the deacons and the elders and everybody standing around. It's set up for like a, a perfect place or environment for you to live holy. But I want you to know, none of that is holy before God. All you're doing is dressing up what you are on the inside. You see, so it's not about going to a place of worship. It's about having worship on the inside of you. Jesus said, they that worship God will worship him in spirit and in truth. You know, it's not about where you worship. It's not about what you put on. The posture that you take on where worship and prayer is concerned is always the attitude of the heart. That's going to be a hard thing to go before God in prayer and ask God for all these things like David is doing and then leave away from prayer and act uncircumspect. 
before people and before God. You know, sometimes we can't get away from prayer fast enough before we fall back into our carnal nature. You want to carry what you do in prayer to the world, the relationship you have with God and the devotion that you have with God. You want to make sure that that is mirrored in the world today. So when you walk away from the presence of God into the world, you carry the presence of God with you. It's on the inside of you. You live in a circumspect and holy and sanctified life. All right. So uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. Now, let's take a look at verse seven. He says this, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and declare all thy wonders. So when I'm going before God, I want to go before God with the proclamation of his wonders and his greatness through an attitude of gratitude to have a heart of thanksgiving. You know, and I'm practicing every day to be more thankful to God for where I'm at in my life and what I have in my life. You know, I don't want to get beyond what God has done for me and yet not respect what he's done for me and start looking for more. Sometimes children do that. You can do so much for children and they don't understand the value of that. And they want more and more and more. And as parents, we have to teach them to be thankful for what you have and to be content with such as you have, as the Bible talks about, because you can keep going more and more and more and more. But I've learned in my life that less before God is more. Sometimes you can get so much, you can get a sense of being spoiled and entitled uh, before God, but less before God is more. Because when you have God and a relationship with God, the way that the Bible says, you don't have as big a desires as you've had when you were in the world. You're not empty. You're not coming to God on empty. You're kind of coming to God on full. And when people come to God and they're empty on the inside, all they can think about is their own wants and their own needs. But when we come to God full of desire and worship and love for him and gratitude for him and walking in a circumspect manner before God, man, that prayer will be very different than you coming to God when you're empty. And see, so you want to fill up on the word of God and you want to learn to be thankful for the things that you have and the things that God has given you. How about be thankful that you have eyesight and that you can hear well? that you can even talk and have a voice, that you breathe well, you know, that you still have limbs, you have hands, arms, feet, you know, you can go about without pain in your body. There are a lot of people today who are bedridden, who can't do that. And so you want to not take anything for granted that you have today, but be mindful that the mercy and grace of God has been afforded you because of Jesus Christ. So important to know. This is a powerful prayer that David was praying. He was asking God to vindicate him. And see, when you live this way, it would be appropriate to ask God to vindicate because David had so many things come against him. He needed God's rescue. And so verse eight, let's go on to verse eight. He says, oh Lord, this is David talking to the Lord. He says, I love the habitation of thy house. Now, David was talking about the place of worship at that time, but what he's really talking about is the presence of God. And we know that God is too big for any house. He's too big for any cathedral or building or synagogue. The whole house of God is the earth. The Bible says that the earth is his footstool, but his throne is in heaven. So when it talks about, I love the habitation of thy house, he's talking about the assembly of God. He's talking about the presence of God. Where God is, is where David says he loves. He says, O oh Lord, I love the habitation of thy house and the place where thy glory dwells. Well, nowadays, since Jesus has died and rose again, the glory of the Lord is revealed in us. Where God resides is in the born again believer. And so David could speak of this because it hadn't happened yet. But now after Jesus has come and offered his life as a sacrifice, man, the habitation of God is in the believer. You know, and that's really important that God is nigh. He is close to us. He's not far away on some distant planet. He is right here in our presence. And so we need to be mindful and be circumspect when it comes to that. Remember, when we talk about circumspect, we want to be careful and considerate. And of all those possible circumstances and consequences of those circumstances, that would be a definition. And then be alert, careful, cautious, conservative, considerate, be guarded, be heedful and safe. These are the things that we talk about when it comes to being circumspect. All right. Now in verse nine, he says this, do not take my soul away along with the sinners. And he's longing. He's not assuming or just assuming the fact that he's okay with God. 
He knows what's going to happen to the sinners because God has revealed to them. He said, don't take my soul away with the sinners. So David would pray like that because remember, he did not have the revelation that we have today. He did not have uh, the sacrifice that Jesus died and rose again and now sits at the right hand. David was looking to the cross and we're looking from the cross. There's a big difference. You know, David was looking to a day of salvation and we live in a day of salvation. You see, Jesus Christ, his blood was shed for us so that we can come to know God in a real way. David hadn't come to that yet because God was foretelling through David what was going to happen in the future. So he would pray prayers like this. Don't take my soul away along with sinners, nor my life with men of bloodshed. You see, and so that would be appropriate for him to pray at this time. In verse 10, listen, he says, in whose hands is a wicked scheme and whose right hand is full of bribes. Now watch in verse 11. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity, redeem me and be gracious to me. He says, my foot stands on a level place and in the congregation, I shall bless the Lord. You know, in other words, among the congregation of the people, among the congregation of the heavenly hosts, I mean, David said, I will bless the Lord. You know, to say I will bless the Lord is a choice. It is a decision that you have to make that I will bless the Lord at all times. You know, I'll give praise continually from my lips and my heart. You know, I will sing praises unto him from my heart. You see, in the midst of your circumstances, in the midst of possible danger, in the midst of all things that could go wrong, like us today, we're living in an, a pandemic that we know nothing really about. And they tell us every day, bad news, it's getting worse. We need to do this, we need to do that. We need to be circumspect before the Lord. We need to trust the Lord. He is in control. He has all of this in his control. We need not to be hasty about anything. We don't need to be pushy about anything. We need to relax in his presence and do what David said here. He says in verse 12, he says, my foot stands on, on a level place in the congregation. I shall bless the Lord. Why don't we just bless the Lord while this stuff is going on? You know, while economic disaster is happening, while movements and protests is going on, why don't we just bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me? Why don't we just shout out to the Lord how great he is and how marvelous he is and how majestic he is, because that's what's going to take us and elevate us above the circumstances so we can live and walk in a circumspect manner before God. Now, that's a lot. That prayer is a lot. Next week, when we get together, God willing, I'm going to take you to an area of scripture that's going to teach us more about how to live in a circumspect manner before God. And I want to thank you again for listening. I want you to think about these things. And again, please go back and read this again for yourself and make it a prayer of your own. Make it something that you want to be pleasing to God in the same way that David was and be a blessing. Just begin to bless the Lord with your soul, bless him with your body, bless him with your mind and everything. And remember these words from Ephesians chapter three, verse 20. Now unto him who is able to do far above what you can think or even ask in Jesus name.